Okay, let's get started. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us uh, in our last uh, Oxpal lecture. Um, so um, today, uh, uh, Jen will join us again in the um, second um, academic writing webinar. And uh, today it will be a, a more practical session. So Jen will kind of, um, as you saw in the handout, will try to um you know um make you feel that you are editing your word and therefore giving yourself like a feedback on what you are writing so thank you so much jen and uh, uh please uh, start the lecture thank you hi everyone and ramadan kareem to everyone who's celebrating um so welcome back this is scientific language it's the second session on academic writing um, as asad said i'm jen um, i work for the uk equator center at the university of oxford so just a quick intro to those of you who are new um, after doing a phd in biochemistry i moved into academic copy editing first privately and now i work for a team of medical statisticians at the university of oxford um, and i teach academic writing skills I mentioned the UK Equator Centre. We're part of the Equator Network. It's an international organisation aiming to enhance the quality and transparency of health research by improving the quality of health research writing. And the way that we do that is, well, all of the research you do is based on existing literature. So by improving how people write about their research today, we're ensuring better quality research tomorrow. We do this in... Um, uh, uh, three, uh, we do this in three ways. We raise awareness of tools called reporting guidelines, which are what we talked about in detail last week. Um, we have a site filled with resources on academic writing, including all of the reporting guidelines available for human research. And we offer education and training, which is why I'm here today. And again, a huge thank you to Cancer Research UK, whose funding supports the UK Equator Centre's programme of research and training. So a couple of quick housekeeping points. Handouts. You should all have a handout with the key points from today's session. Please let us out know, just you pop it in the chat box right now if you don't, and he can ping that up to you. Two, interaction. As last time, I want to hear from you. Please pop your questions and your comments into the chat box as we go along. I've got it open um, and I'll do my best to answer your questions as well. Um, I'm also going to be asking you a lot more questions this time around than last time. And then three, feedback. Uh, please let me know if I'm talking too quickly or too slowly or if there's any technical glitches. So this is my chance to check. Can everybody see my screen OK? Can everybody see me OK? Can everyone hear me OK? If there are any problems at any point, just let us know and then we can see that. Right. Um, with today's session. Abdullah, nice to meet you again too. It's awesome that you're back. Oh, last week we talked about a 10-step process for preparing a manuscript for publication. And I just wanted to know who here uh, was here last time and who's joining us for the first time. So pop it in the comment box. Is this your first time or did you join us last time? For those who are new today, please don't worry. Um, this session stands alone. You don't need to have seen the previous session, um, but I do encourage you to go back and watch that recording because the two do link. So yes, how many folks are, have, were, were joining me last time? Ibrahim, first time. Shahid, attended last time. Excellent. Abdallah, it's your second time. Asil, first time. Lovely. So there's a bit of a mix, which is cool. So those of you who um, are new, we, we're going to do lots of interaction and lots of chat. Those of you who are here for the second time, please keep chatting with me. I really enjoyed it. Enas is here again. Allah, great. Maha, awesome. Arub, first time for you. Cool. So it's great to see how many of you are, have now found your chat box and you're chatting in with me. So this is great. Let's keep that going the whole time. So great that so many of you are joining us again for the second time. So one of our key points last week was that we separate out, we separate out generating new text from editing our text so that we do those as two separate processes. We talked about writing first and then editing so that we don't block the generation of new ideas when we're writing. And then we were coming into step eight of our process was polishing and revising existing text. So that's what we're going to focus on today. And I'd love to know from you, 
what do you think about academic writing and scientific style? When you think about that, um, any emotions, associations, descriptions, anything you like, let me know what you think about when you think of academic writing, academic style. Oh, cool. Malak's seen the previous one on YouTube. Awesome that you've seen the recording. I know the sound wasn't perfect on that. Hopefully it's a bit better this time. I've tried a few things. So yeah, what are your associations? Do I clear information that that's what's going to be in a scientific language? Yes. Anybody else? Any other associations with academic writing style? Right. So Ibrahim, it's got to be well-written. Yeah. Um, Malak, it's got to be like a story. Yes. Abdullah, clear, precise language. Awesome. Uh, Mosa, it's got to be a description. Muhammad, it's got to be well referenced. Yasser, that it's got to be evidence based. Asil, it's got to be complete. Um, Allah, of official language, no emotions. Great. So we've got a wide range of ideas that we've got about what scientific language, what academic writing has got to be like. And these are all great. I agree with a lot of these. Doha, easy to understand, completely agree. Okay. So it can be this perception when we read a lot of the existing academic writing that it can be quite steep, it can be quite formal, and sometimes it can be quite difficult to read. And I don't think that's what it needs to be like. Um, I think the kinds of things that we've just been talking about are where we'd like to go. We've got to go back to what the point of academic writing is. When you've done research, whatever the type, and you want to share it with the world, you're doing that because you know health research can only improve lives if it is shared. And that's usually through the journal article, which means that readers need articles that they can actually use. And I think it boils down to three things. They need articles that they can easily read, that they can easily understand, and that has enough details for their use which can break down to our big three points, which is we want articles that are simple, clear, and complete. That's what we want. Many of the articles that you've read might not meet these criteria, but I'm really glad to see that, that this matches really well with the kinds of things that you want from academic writing. Um, so we're going to be talking through this session about some tools to help you make sure that your academic writing is simple, clear, and complete. Pretty much everything I say over the next hour is a suggestion or ideas. Very little, little of it is going to be hard and fast rules you must, must follow. The goal is to become more intentional about our language choices, to think about why we're saying things the way that we do. These suggestions, though, are also really going to help with word count. So if you've ever struggled to get something down into the required number of words, hopefully this will help. We're going to talk about five stages of revision. First off, we're going to talk about the expectations of scientific language, those building blocks. And just as a caveat up front, we're going to have to use the conventions of our field. We are going to need to fit into the academic discourse, the, the kinds of language that other folks writing in our field use. We need to fit with them. But that doesn't mean we can't communicate simply and clearly. So we're going to talk about sort of four basic building blocks, paragraphs, sentences, tenses, and voice. So the basic ingredients of any form of writing, when you look at a passage, are paragraphs, sentences, and words. And we're going to focus in on paragraphs for a moment. A paragraph is just a collection of sentences that all cover one theme together. And these are the any other sentences in the piece. For scientific writing, academic writing, there's no fixed rule for how long a paragraph should be. But you don't really want to have lots of really long paragraphs. They can be quite tricky to read. So if you find yourself routinely running a whole half a page or a whole page for the paragraph, it's probably all not one theme, might need a break. 
equally, you don't really want too many very, very short paragraphs. Every now and then a super short, maybe even one sentence paragraph can work really well. But when you have a lot of one sentence paragraphs, one after another, it starts reading a little bit like a news article, like a newspaper story, not like formal writing. And we also, for interest's sake, sort of mixing up the lengths of paragraphs so they're not all fixed five lines long. If you have sort of a rule in your head, boom, 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 always the same. Mixing it up for reader's interest is also really helpful. So paragraphs are made up of sentences and a sentence is just a collection of words that at minimum has a verb, that's the doing word, and it can have a subject which is doing the doing and an object which is experiencing the doing and the sentence can get a lot more complex adding phrases and clauses and we know in academic writing sentences can get quite complex and quite long but essentially even in academic writing ideally one sentence covers one idea or it starts getting really long for your reader to cope with so how do you know that you're getting too long have a look at your punctuation it's one of the, the things that you could have a look at. Punctuation is another of those building blocks. You're aiming for no more than three pieces of punctuation or joining words per sentence. And speaking of punctuation, commas and full stops, use as many of them as you like. When it comes to the semicolon and the colon, try and be much more sparing in your use. I don't know about you, I love semicolons but I use them too often. We often use the semicolon because we want to tell the reader that these two sentences here belong together more than any other two sentences. They're really close to one another, but actually together. So if I'm worried that my reader won't be able to know that these two sentences belong together, that's usually a sign that my paragraph is maybe too long or not ordered particularly well. That semicolon we want to save as an emphasis technique because it says read through this one sentence into the next one for a conclusion. It's kind of forcing through an emphasis, which means we want to use it sparingly, very seldom, so that it still retains that emphasis, it retains that power. So I've been talking far too long already in a row. Let's have some fun with practicing. We're going to be putting everything we covered today into practice using this one play paragraph. This paragraph is grammatically correct. It's just not particularly nice to read yet. So if I read it to you quickly, once study nurses had been trained by the trial team, each of the five sites commenced recruitment and aimed to initiate the protocol in their first patient within a one month period where failure to achieve this would result in the receipt of additional training. It is important to note that the protocol was terminated for a participant if any exacerbation of pain was reported. How nice was that to listen to or to read if you're reading along? I would imagine not, not fantastic. I mean, if, if, you, if you like this, please feel free to pop in the comment box or if you hate it, pop it in the comment box. How did you feel about this? I find it quite tricky to read and to follow. So let's focus in first on the first sentence. It's really long. It's really long. How many sentences do you think this could, could easily split into? If you had a look at this sentence, this really long sentence, have a look and sort of go, how many sentences? And if you could tell me how many you think it should split. And if you'd like to, you can point out where you think the split points could be. So if you identify maybe the word where we would want to start the new sentences. So where would you split this sentence up? Asma wants to do three sentences. Nice. Where would you split them? Allah says four or five sentences. Okay, cool. What does everybody else think? Tasia says three sentences. So how are you figuring this out? Doa says three sentences. Okay. How are you figuring out where you would make the breaks? Ibrahim, two to three sentences. Yeah. Valkyrie says three. 
Has anyone got an idea on how you would figure out where you could split these up? Um, Raya says, um, popular period, um, where basically that first comma is. Yeah. First a trial, second a period. Yes. So essentially, so Muhammad is stopping them at the commas, uh, at the two commas. Yes. So folks are all using the commas as their way of knowing where to split the sentences. Great. That is a really nice way of checking where the different ideas are coming in. So let me show you where I could think about it. So if I would look at it, sorry, um, we look at the potential breaks using the punctuation marks to start with. Yes. So the first one would be comma each, but there's something else that we can also use as a way of spotting where another idea is happening. And that's the joining words, that and, that conjunction. That's another place where there's clearly a change in idea. So the sites commenced recruitment and then they aimed to initiate two different ideas, right? And then get where now the whole idea is starting there so there's four clear ideas happening here we can split this into um, four sentences we need a little reword each time to make them work so let's do that um, we could just pop in that full stop after team like so many of you were suggesting so study nurses had been trained by the trial team full stop each of the five sites then commenced recruitment full stop they aimed to initiate the protocol in their first one month period full stop failure to achieve this would result in receipt of additional training we can make those four sentences so hopefully that's a little bit easier to read does everyone agree that's a little easier a little easier to follow and we've not made things we've not changed any of the information we've just made it that little bit easier and when we do first drafts we do tend to write like this long run-on sentences which is why when we're revising a good first step is to go through and think okay which of my sentences needs splitting up? So that was paragraphs and sentences. Now let's talk about tense because there are some clear rules for scientific writing, academic writing, when it comes to tense. Anything that is generally known should be in the present tense. Anything that's generally known should be in the present tense. So for instance, the sky is blue. It's generally known, so it's present tense. We all know this. But anything that's been discovered by a specific study should be in the past tense. So some smart people found that the sky was blue. They did a study and they found some results. So that is past tense. And when we talk about specific studies, that includes yours. So what did you do? We repeated what the smart people did. That's our method. So our method, past tense. And we also found that the sky was blue. That's our results, also in the past tense. There's also a third tense that we can see in academic writing, future tense. You'll see a lot of future tense um, for planned methods, uh, future research, that kind of thing, things we plan to do in the future. And that what it looks like is sort of we will repeat the smart people's experiment. That's what we plan to do. I mentioned this specifically because we need to check when we are writing our methods section, often we copy paste the methods from a grant application or a protocol, and then we pop it into our paper. And we sometimes forget to switch the tense to past. So have a look out for that. It's something that peer reviewers sometimes snag. So let's practice again. Let's put that into practice again. Um, let's go back to our paragraph and let's have a look through it. So this in general is in the past tense. It's a, it's a method section. We can see there's a were trained, there was a commenced, aimed, was terminated, was reported. This is all clearly past tense. So it's all what they did. But if I zero in on the sentence here, failure to achieve this would result in the receipt of additional training. What's going on here? What tense is going on here? Is this past tense? Yeah, Muhammad saying no. Asma saying future, Ibrahim, future question mark. Yeah. So what's happened is you're quite right. This was future tense. This isn't, um, it's, this is a type of past tense, but it's not the past tense we want. So what happened was, it was future tense. It used to say will result. But then when we were turning it into past tense, we made a mistake because it's not would result. 
this thing has happened. We can turn it into proper past tense. So there we go, resulted. We can fix it to resulted. So that's something to keep in mind when you're going through, because sometimes would have resulted, we don't have to use would have resulted because it's happened. So it's just resulted. Because we already happened. The essentially it's it's perfect past tense is what's happening over there, and we don't need it. It's a, a different kind of tense that we don't need in this kind of writing. So it's just the thing that has already happened, done. It's happened, it's resulted. And we've already saved a word. Always good. So now that we've thought about tense, let's think about voice. So there's two voices that we need to worry about. The active voice, the subject does something. In the passive voice, the subject has something done to it. Which one has traditionally been preferred in academic writing? Asil passive, yes. So Mohammed, active, Allah, passive. This is interesting that you guys are saying different things because you're quite right. There has there is a shift happening at the moment. I think it's we can almost say that shift is sort of midway. There used to be a very strong focus in academic writing on passive voice because this was what there was this idea that passive voice was more objective. But we have since recognized that there's a problem with passive voice. What is the problem with passive voice? I'll show you an example. The dog was walked on Saturday. What is the problem with the sentence? What's missing? What's the question you want to ask when I give you the sentence? Asma, with whom? Who walked the dog? Yes, yes, there's a whole bunch of you all saying who walked the dog. Here's the problem with the passive voice. It lets us get away or it lets us forget to say who did the thing. In the active voice, I can't forget. I have to start with who walked the dog on Saturday. I have to say who did it, which is why there's been a move in academic writing away from passive voice and towards active voice as much as possible. So totally fine to use passive voice. Use passive voice. Just check: have I left out who is doing the work? Because sometimes it's important for me to include that information. Sometimes it's important for me to say who did a particular thing. So let's put that into practice, and we'll focus in on that first sentence of our paragraph: Is the sentence active or passive? Passive, Mohammed. Yes, passive. As great. This as is passive. So, how do we know it's passive? It says "were trained by." That "were trained by" phrasing is how you know it's passive. That "by" word over there. So that's how we know it's passive. It's passive voice that is telling you everything, though. It says that the study nurses were trained by the trial team. So you know both who had something done to them, and you know who did the thing. How could you change the sentence to make it active? How would you rewrite it? Asma, put trial team in first. Exactly. So just to make it active, we just switch the two around. The trial team trained the study nurses from Mohammed. Yes, Basha also. Trial team trained the study nurses. Exactly. So we just switch it around. What's really lovely about the active voice when you have to say who did the thing is it saves you two words every single time. So if we all see that, we went from the study nurses were trained by the trial team, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine words, two, three, four, five, six, seven words. So we went from nine to seven words. Great, we've just saved two whole words. And I don't know about you, but every single word I can get in my bank. Let's have a look. At the last sentence. The last sentence is also passive voice because we've got the protocol was terminated and we've got the exacerbation of pain was reported. But what's missing here? Who 
who, Yara, exactly. Who is missing? Fatima, yes, who. We want to know who did the terminating and who did the reporting. And this is why um, there's such a push towards moving towards active voice now. Because in this kind of a paragraph, it, it really does matter. It matters when I look at your study and I try and judge it, it matters to me whether the patient got to tell me that their pain got, was exacerbated or whether some other individual reported that information. It really matters. Are these patient reported outcomes or somebody else reported outcomes? It really matters. So by forcing ourselves to add in who did the thing, we are adding in that in extra information. We are being much more complete. So in this case, we did the study. So we know this information. Let's just add it in. Let's just say that the nurse did the terminating and the participant did the reporting. Cool. Now let's rewrite the sentence to make it active voice. Now we've got two passive bits to switch around. So we're just going to switch them around. Do you guys want to take a moment and see how would you do it? What would you do? So yeah, Fatima, the team terminates the protocol. Yes, so we're just going to switch those around. So we'll switch them both around. It is important to note that the nurse terminated the protocol for a participant if the participant reported any exacerbation of pain. Great, we've switched those two around. Now that we've done that though, this is where I want to show you kind of a next step when it comes to revising and polishing, which is if I was doing this, I would then think, oh, now it feels a little clunky to me because there's a long duplication of phrase happening. We've got the words for a participant, if the participant next to each other, and that doesn't sound nice. I don't like that duplication happening. So what I could do to fix it is I would switch around the clauses. So I would take that bit about if a participant reported any exacerbation of pain, put that for the beginning and then say, it is important to note that the nurse terminated the protocol. And I like the solution because I've brought the participant to the beginning of the sentence. I have put the emphasis on the participant and what they're doing. And I think that's really important when we're writing about health research is putting our participants front and center. So that's an idea for when you start seeing things being a bit clunky, move clauses around in the sentence. So that's um, well, now that you've got your, your good practice with your tense and your voice and your sentences, your paragraphs, on too long. Oh, Maham, sorry, because a question. What about using them instead of the participant? That is a really good question. And I want you to hold on to that because we're going to come to a problem with, with those potential issues. When I was doing this edit, that is something I considered, but it added in a little bit of ambiguity. So, Mohammed, hold that thought. Could we use them instead of the participant? Let's check that in a moment. So we've done scientific language. Now we're going to think about writing clearly. Our main goal now is to make sure that there is never a moment where the reader has to assume something because you aren't physically there for them to ask you and that you can clarify. We'll talk about four ways to ensure clear language. Subjects, pronouns, comparisons, and verbs. So, subjects. Here's an example. I finished writing the first draft of my article on the day the article was due. This is not an advisable writing practice. Can you spot where the potential ambiguity is? Where is there a space for me to, for the reader to misunderstand what I'm trying to say? Allah is asking what day? Muhammad's asking what article? Amani's also asking what day it is. Okay, so the day in the article is you already know that there is a day and that there's an article. Um, I'm asking though, what is the ambiguity in meaning? 
So rather than adding extra information, where is there a space where um, I might start making up what the meaning is? Besson, the advisable writing. What, what, yes, this is not advisable, the advisable writing practice. Yes, that's what I'm getting to. It's that sneaky word, this. Because the question with that word, this, is what do I actually mean? And I might say to you, oh, no, 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 it's fine. I mean the whole previous sentence, except I don't really. I mean something in particular. I might mean this lack of editing, or I might mean this poor time management. I mean something about, I've interpreted the previous sentence. I'm pulling some um, nugget of information out of it, and that's what I mean. And we do this a lot. You'll see this happen a lot. We start these sentences and we just sort of say, oh, this, everything that comes before. A way of avoiding the type of ambiguity is if you see a this, a these, or those, often at the beginning of a sentence, stop and have a look. Is it clear what you mean? And if not, add a noun, add a noun phrase, in, either instead of that this or just after it. So that was subjects. How about pronouns? Here's another example. After the research group finished its article, it underwent review. Where's the ambiguity? Where could you misunderstand me? Where do you have to make an assumption to understand what I'm saying? Doa, it, asthma, it, Leela, yes. It's the sneaky word, it. So why is it a problem? Because upstream, there are two words in that sentence that are also singular. So both research group and article are referring to one thing, and it refers to one thing. Oh dear, which means I could mean the article underwent review, or I could mean the group underwent review. At this point, when you've replaced that it with the noun, sometimes the sentence gets a bit ugly. It starts feeling a bit clunky. So what we can do is think about rewriting. We could have said, after the researchers finished their article, it underwent review. And there would have been no ambiguity because researchers is plural, there is plural. Article is singular, it is singular. There would have been no ambiguity. So that's always an option, is remove the ambiguity and think about rewriting. So how do you spot if you've got any of these issues? Have a look for any it, they, them, he, she's, and have a look upstream in the sentence. Is it completely clear what that pronoun is referring to? If so, if not, add a noun. So that was pronouns. How about comparisons? This is one we see a lot in editing. So participants aged 16 through 25 years showed a greater improvement in spatial reasoning at six week follow-up. Where's the ambiguity? Where could you potentially misunderstand me? Greater than, Yara. Yes, Enas, it's not clear who they're compared to. Exactly. It's that word greater, because you're asking than who or than what. I could mean all of the other groups or maybe one particular group I've not said. I could even mean other follow-up times I've not said. It's really unclear. And this happens a lot. So whenever you get compressed, you see a greater, less, or compared. Have a look at that paragraph and ask yourself, is it completely clear than who or than what? Sometimes it is. You've just been talking about two groups and then you say, which one is greater? Okay, totally makes sense. Very often it is not clear. And if it's not, add in that comparator. Add in that comparator. Okay. So I see there was a hand raised if anyone wants to ask a question. Are there any questions before we move on? Okay, feel free to just type your question and pop it in the box. So that was comparisons. We're lastly just going to look at clear verbs. This is a little different. So if I was to write, after conducting an investigation of pain after knee surgery, came to the conclusion that physiotherapy reduced pain. So, what are the verbs in the sentence? What are the two verbs? What are the two doing words? 
came and conducting. Yes, exactly. Came and conducting are the two verbs. These are the verbs that we'd say, so this is what it's saying we did. But what did I actually do? Because I wasn't conducting and coming, right? What was I actually doing? So what are the real verbs, the hiding verbs? Asthma, after we conduct. So what comes afterwards? What are the real verbs? Because we didn't conduct. Ah, yes, Besson, inve uh, Besson, investigating an Amni conclusion. Exactly. Those are the hiding verbs. Exactly. Muhammad, yes, investigating and investigated and concluded. So if we have a look, it says conducted an investigation and came to the conclusion. We have hidden the verb. So as you're all saying, exactly, I can change conducted the investigation to investigating and came to the conclusion to concluded. Those were the real verbs. And by uncovering those real verbs, I've just got rid of two words every time. So I've just saved another four words. Yes, extra words. So this is called nominalization, or the, the name of it. Um, it's basically when a verb, a real verb, gets turned into a noun, and then a weak verb, a weaselly verb, gets added in front of it. So what you want to do is look for those places where you hit a real verb, and you've relied on a weasel verb, and what you want to do is free the true verb. And every time, you'll save two words. Exactly. Hassan, don't bury the verb super helpful, gets rid of those extra words. So let's put this into practice. Let's go back to our paragraph and they're going to think about clear language and I want you to zero in on this sentence here. Failure to achieve this resulted in the receipt of additional training. Thinking about this sentence and everything we've just been talking about, what is the potential problem with this sentence? What is missing? What's not great about this sentence? Has Hanan, yes, this. So that this word, it's just a floating this. Is there anything else where you're going, oh, thinking about all the things we've done so far? Yes, that this is, that missing this, lots of you are picking up on that missing this. Exactly. It, what does it refer to? Ah, Muhammad, the receipt of is not necessary. Yes. Okay, great. Reham, who failed? Ah, interesting question. Who failed exactly? So, who failed? Who received this additional training? Yes, Muhammad, who received the additional training? As I said it, great. So we've uncovered a few things that are wrong with the sentence now that we've zeroed in on it. So let's go through that. There's that floating this that you were all mention, mentioning. Problem. There's this resulted in the receipt of. That resulted is a bit of a weak verb. What's the real verb going on there? It's received. It's hiding under the receipt of. The real verb is received. And if we're asking about received, well then, who received this training? Who did the failure? So how could we improve the sentence to fix all of these issues? Does anyone want to have a go at fixing the sentence? What could you say instead? This is a tricky one. Ah, Muhammad, the nurses who failed at initiating the protocol received additional training. Nice. Okay. So what he's done there is we've got, um, we've, we've made the sentence active and we've tried to fill in all of those gaps, which is great. So let's uh, break down what, what, how I tackled it. So this is what I did. I've uncovered um, the verb received. So I've got rid of in the receipt, resulted in the receipt of, just use received. And I've made it active. So I've said that the sites who did not achieve this target. And then I've added in, I could just say this target. So like that's how I could get around that floating this. So sites that did not achieve this target received additional training. I could do that. But actually, 
if I think about the previous sentence as well, which is talking about the target, and I start saying, okay, well, achieve this target, that's a bit of a, a weak way of saying it maybe, what is the actual target, and let's get explicit, and I say it, and it's sites that did not initiate the protocol in their first patient within a one month period. Well, now I've just repeated the entire previous sentence, which means that aimed to is another weak little phrase. It's another weaselly little phrase. What it means is it's left over from a protocol. We're not aiming to do anything anymore. We've done it. We can get rid of that whole previous sentence. So we've just lost a whole sentence and made a much clearer, more complete sentence. Sites that did not initiate the protocol in their first patient within a one month period received additional training. Done. Okay. So as we're going through, you can see we do the step process. We are tightening up the language. We're shortening things out and we're making it much more clear. So that was clarity, talking about clear language. Now we're going to talk about using simple language. So sometimes we can worry about people underestimating our work if we don't sound fancy. There is really this worry. I get asked about this a lot. But I want to really reassure you, your work is already awesome. Your work is already amazing. Your research is going to change the world, right? In its own little way. We don't need to cloud it in fancy extra language. It stands on its own. It is that great. So we don't need to add in fancy language. So we're going to talk about three different things here. We're going to talk about simple comparisons, reducing linker words, and using simple words. So choosing simple words. So first, let's talk about comparisons. You want to always think about your reader. You want them to be able to understand what you're saying. And your reader comes from all over the globe. And we don't ever want our reader to be saying, going, what? I don't get it when they're, they're reading our writing. So really silly example. Who here knows what I mean if I say I'm holding thumbs for you? If I say I'm holding thumbs for you, does anyone know what that means? Yes or no in the comments? Anybody heard of holding thumbs? Nope. Nope. Basha, Ala, Anna's no idea. No. Lots of no's. I expect this. Totally fine. Um, how about if I was to say I'm crossing fingers for you? Has anyone heard of that? Crossing fingers. Leela says, ah, good luck. Besson said, yes. They, so a lot of you know what crossing fingers means which I expected. So most of you have heard of crossing fingers. It means wishing luck. It means wishing you luck in South Africa, where I grew up. Now, when I first moved to the United Kingdom, um, and I would say to someone, I'm holding thumbs for you, they were like, what are you even on about? I do not understand. That was fine because I was standing right there with them and they could say to me, what are you on about? And I could say, I'm wishing you luck. How do you not know what this means? And it completely baffled me that nobody had heard of this, except for, I think I've met people who've heard about it who are from the Czech Republic and Poland. Those have been the folks who've, who've also heard of this or who also use the same phrase, holding thumbs. The problem with academic writing, um, Allah, does holding thumbs means I'm waiting for you to succeed? Yes, I'm, I'm wishing you luck. I'm holding thumbs. I'm hoping you'll succeed. That's exactly what it means. It means almost the same as I'm, I'm crossing my fingers for you. Now, usually somebody can ask you that in person, but somebody reading your words can't ask you. And we don't want to send people to the internet to figure out what our phrases mean when they are reading our academic writing. People are reading a lot. They are having to read huge volumes. We want to make things as easy, as accessible as possible. So here's an example of a title of a real editorial. It's a lovely editorial. The actual editorial is really well written. I like it. But the title is a bit tricky. So it's overcoming the Tower of Babel in medical science by finding the equator research reporting guidelines. Do you understand what this editorial is about from this title? Wallace says no. Fatima says no. 
no, Amini, Miriam says, no, 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 no one's got a clue. You are not alone. I would say the vast majority of people I've shown this title to have gone, oh, we're going to break it down. Starting with the Tower of Babel. Who here has heard of the story of the Tower of Babel? Muhammad says, oh, maybe it's about achieving something hard. Good, good, good attempt. Yes, good guess. Quick kind, yeah. Um, so, Tower of Babel. Has anybody heard of that story? Muath, no. Never, Doa, no. No. Mosa, no. Has anybody heard? So nobody's heard of the story so far. Never heard of it. Great. So, for those who don't know, the Tower of Babel is a story from some cultural traditions about how people ended up speaking lots of different languages and not being able to understand each other. Now, I teach people from a wide range of backgrounds and countries, and I find sort of on average, maybe half of the people in a room um, from like a very mixed backgrounds will know what this is. Um, and I've had some classrooms where maybe 5% of people will know. So you guys with your answers, pretty standard. But let's keep going with this title. It's not the only thing confusing about it. The other bit is this finding the equator. What is finding the equator to do with? Do we have any idea what that might be saying? Anyone want to hazard a guess? Standards or center, muath yara, yes. So they are, it's a play on words. Muhammad, the ultimate truth. That's a nice way of looking at it. Um, so it's a play on words, I think, because again, I've never asked the authors. I think it's a play on words, looking at both um, Islam, yes, the website, the Equator Network, so where I work, the Equator Network, and the geographical equator around the, the world. I think it's a play on words, sort of saying, um, about both the world and the equator network. And I think that the title is trying to say, in total, that the equator network and reporting guidelines help prevent misunderstandings in health research. Is that obvious for everybody? <laughs> and I've, I've got some smiley faces going on in the comments. No, it's not obvious, right? And I'm sure the authors did not intend to confuse people to the point that we just spent five minutes talking about this. Because this is the problem. It is really easy to use the kind of word play and make it tricky for others. Not because you're trying to make it tricky, but because you use the phrases and the word play that makes sense to you and that you think, oh, this is fun. Everyone's gonna, this is gonna be fun for people to read. The problem is, our readers come from such a wide range of places. We have to make sure that our readers don't know to have grown up in the same country as us, read the same books as us, watched the same TV shows as us, to be able to understand what we are saying. Which means, ideally, in academic writing, things like metaphors, similes, literary allusions, all of that wonderful wordplay that's so much fun that we can use in other kinds of writing in academic writing we can't use unless we take the time to explicitly explain them so avoid that kind of writing as much as possible right moving on from comparisons to linkers linking words are words that join sentences together while showing the direction of the join so they show how your logic um, flows from sentence to sentence they're mostly conjunctive adverbs if you're curious um, common examples things like similarly however therefore in addition lastly interestingly they're really useful words but we tend to overuse them so once we've done a first draft, we tend to have a linker word on just about every single sentence because that's how we explain the flow of our ideas to ourselves from first draft to polished draft. And then our question is, do they all need to make it through the rounds of polishing? And usually we can remove a few of them. So certain of these words we can think about. So the words like similarly, likewise, they just mean that we're keeping on going in the same direction. Sometimes that's completely clear from your paragraph. So test them. Do they really need them? 
do you need if you need them a check just ask those questions to yourself um, and then words like however despite whereas while these are words that show a direction change um, but you need to ask yourself am i actually because sometimes we use a direction change word we're not really it's just two sentences next to each other which is totally fine um, and sometimes we change direction every single sentence and if you do that you're going to make your reader a bit dizzy so it might suggest that sentences need to be reordered so that the same ideas are all together and then there's those words like therefore and thus and hence which means i've concluded i've arrived somewhere but be really deliberate are you actually concluding or have you just got to the end of the paragraph so with all of these words take them out does it work without the word if not put it back in but very often you'll take it out and go actually my paragraph flows just fine without this linker word so they're words to just test and play around with there's other linkers that are generally you can ignore them so words like in addition furthermore what's more additionally they just say please keep reading you can usually leave them out uh, words like lastly and finally they're often just at the end of a list they say thanks so much for carrying on reading again quite often you can take those out um, and then words like counting words first second third they are usually pointless or if not pointless they indicate where we might need something else so if your counting is all within one paragraph or two paragraphs say you say i'm going to talk about three methods xyz first chat 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 second chat 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 third chat 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 if i can see within that next two paragraphs you don't need to count for me i'll remember that there are three things just above but if it's happening over a couple of pages over many paragraphs the problem is i'm not actually going to remember that you told me there's three things i'll have forgotten even though you then say second and all of a sudden i'm going oh page back through what was the first usually then what it means is you don't need to count in paragraph you need a subheading so it's a good little indication to us add in a subheading and then lastly right at the beginning i said most of these things are suggestions here's a very strong suggestion words like importantly interestingly it is of note interest to note those words well if this is the important bit i'm kind of asking why you make me read the rest. everything you're saying is important i'm kidding but usually these phrases show that you've just given a whole list of same results and they would do better in a table rather than listing something where you feel the need to say sorry for being boring this is the cool bit right here so instead reword so that you've moved the not so cool bits away so you're only talking about the things that are interesting essentially so let's um that was linkers finally we're going to get into the words that you use individual words so as i said work is awesome already right it's already amazing we don't need fancy language so what that means is we can choose single words instead of whole phrases whole double words so there's a lot of these things that we do for instance i see the words prior to a lot when i edit and every single time i'll switch it to before it saves a word every time and it means exactly the same thing similarly i see the word in order to and i will always turn it into to because it means exactly the same thing so i'm interested to hear from you can you think of any other phrases that get overused like that where you could replace the phrase with just one word what kind of phrases can you think of miriam in spite of could be although nice Muhammad, as much as, same as, yeah. Asil, uh, no need nor very. Oh yes, you you could you could leave out the word very most of the time. You're quite right. Hanan says, in spite could be despite. Yes. Hatha and could 
cause. Nice. And every time we are saving words. Doa, joined together is just joined. Exactly. That joined together, it can't be anything else other than joined together. Hanan, after that can just be after. Nice. These are great suggestions, guys. Well done. So, not just changing phrases into words, we can also choose simple individual words. So, for some reason, we're always utilizing. We're never just using. Use is a great word. We're never administering, giving tests. We're always administering tests. Why not just give the test? If any of you have ever done a conference abstract, very often those are character count restricted. So these are things that are going to really help with your character counts. Plus they help with cognitive load. They make it easier for the reader. So again, can you think of any other complex words that we could, use, we could replace with simple ones? Asil, terminate can be end. Yes. Why do we terminate everything in science? Doa, approximately can be about. Yes. Should we do one more? Has anyone got one more? Asil, major can be most. Yes. Majority can be most as well. Or the majority of, we see a lot of. Uh, Hannon, investigate could be test. You could very well. Yeah. Amani, there is no point, could be many. Great. Malak, you could change in addition to additionally. To be honest, Malak, you could usually just drop that phrase entirely most of the time, or you could use also. Also is another lovely little word. So let's put this into practice. Let's simplify the language. So can you spot any potential problem words or phrases in our whole big paragraph? So Yara is asking whether this is still academic writing. Yes, because the reality is that the words that you need to use for your study are going to be complex. So if I take a, an example from my own work when I was doing my study, I was working on um, methyl accepting chemotaxis pro, um, receptors in that rhodobactus pheroides, looking at methyl esterases and methyl transferases. Those are all really long words. I do not need to add any extra long words around them. So if you think about the words you have to use to talk, talk about your science, they're all really long. So using these smaller words just helps free up for the reader and it will still be academic writing. So um, back to our paragraph, Asil is suggested terminated, yes, um, and initiate in here as well, commence as well in here. Any other problem phrases that folks are spotting? Hannon, it is important to note. Yep. Can we spot anything else? Worse instead of exacerbate, says Asil. Nice. Yes, Murath has spotted exacerbation. Yep. Okay, so these are all the ones that I spotted, and we're going to go through them and sort them out. Um, Reem says that using a variety of words is phrase, uh, and phrases is good, isn't it? Yes, Reem, it really is. Um, but let's not, um, we don't have to change the types of words we're using every single sentence. It's all right to use some of the same small words over and over. Um, and it's then maybe more interesting to play around with your sentence structure than to use really, really long words in between. Okay, so yes, so I, um, that first one is each of, what are we going to do with that? And Hannon said we can change that to just in the five sites. We just say the five sites, exactly. We don't need that each of. How about that next one, commenced? Um, and I think we already had an answer from that one. If I scroll back, commenced was going to be, what did folks suggest? Uh, commenced can be start, yes, exactly. So that can just be began or start in the same way initiate can just be start. How about a one month period? A one month period. What could we change that to? Muath, a month, Asil, a month. Exactly. Exactly. We do this a lot. We have this word period that creeps in. It's usually completely unnecessary. Just say within one month because of course that's a within a one month period. Same thing. We've saved word and it's less annoying to read. That additional, what could we change that? We could shorten that up some more if we wanted to. 
We could say more, exactly, Mosa. Um, that exacerbation of pain, whether we've already had somebody who suggested that that could just be worse pain. We reported if a uh, participant reported worse pain. We don't need to say any exacerbation of that phrase. It is important that to note that. Do we need that? No, we don't need it. We can just delete it. Gone. And then that phrase terminated. What could we do there? End or stopped. Exactly. Thank, thanks, Ibrahim and Asil and Reem. So we have ended up shortening this a lot. This is what we've ended up with. So if I'm going to remind you where we started, we started with once the nurses had been trained by the trial team, each of the five sites commenced recruitment and aimed to initiate the protocol in their first patient within a one month period where failure to achieve this would result in the receipt of additional training. It is important to note that the protocol was terminated for a participant if any exacerbation of pain was noted. We have ended up with the trial team trained the study nurses. The five sites then began recruitment. Sites that did not start the protocol in their first patient within one month received more training. If a participant reported worse pain, the nurse stopped the protocol for that participant. Um, so Allah said we've saved three lines. We have. We haven't just saved three lines. We've saved um, a third of the words. We've gone from 64 words to 44 words. And we've added information because remember the first version didn't say who stopped the protocol and who reported the pain. It is still academic writing. This doesn't sound informal. It just sounds easy to read. So Shad's asking um, how to know for sure replacing one word for a simpler one won't change the meaning sometimes. That's a really good question. Sometimes a complex word um, has more meaning to it and then it's a good word to use. Sometimes those words are interchangeable. So the only way to check is to play around with the language and have a look. Sometimes you'll know a particular word means a particular thing and I need that word and that's all right. Saving those complex words for when we actually need them means that there's space for us to use them versus throwing in huge words all the time. Balqui says it's also more clear. Yes, this style of writing is much friendlier for your reader and you don't sound informal. You still sound like a scientist. You just sound like a scientist. You sound like a scientist who understands their own work. You're not trying to hide everything in loads and loads of complex language. So that was some language. And the next two sections are very quick because I know we're coming to the end of our time. Um, so we're going to think about checking the manuscript for completeness. Once you've done all of that revising for being clear and simple, we're going to do a last, a last um, check through. So we're going to go back to the one that we developed last week and we're going to check your message. And just check that your paper still matches the message. Look at both the full manuscript and the abstract. Sometimes things can get lost in the editing. Um, the other thing is we, we talked about picking an audience for your work. Go back and check. Is it clear what you want each audience to do with the work? And is the level of information suitable for all of your different audiences? Have you met those audiences where they are? And then lastly, go back to those instructions that you picked out. So we talked about reporting guidelines being a reminder of the minimum information that somebody needs to fully understand your study. Go grab that reporting guideline again, go through that checklist and make sure you haven't edited out any of the information you need. It does happen. So that's complete message, nice and easy. And then I just wanted to give you a couple of tips, the sort of things I would do before giving a manuscript back to somebody. I would just do little checks like abbreviations. So when you're using an abbreviation, the first time you use it, use the full term and define it and then never use the abbreviation, the, the full term again, only use the abbreviation for the rest of the piece. Spaces. Um, when we're doing editing and using track changes, um, extra double spaces can creep in. Just do a control F and check for them. Do a little search to make sure there's no um, last little double spaces anywhere, unless your instructions for authors specifically requests them. Run a last spell check. Sounds silly. Run a last spell check, but also run a check for um, common misspellings. So if I'm looking at a paper that's about a trial, I'll check trail 
because inevitably we misspell it and the spell check won't pick it up. And formatting. Do a last check to make sure your formatting is perfect throughout. Go back to that instructions for authors of your, from your target journal that we picked out last time and make sure it matches. And if I was doing that, if I went back to our, our paragraph, if I was doing a last edit for perfection, I would spot something like we are referring to our, the people involved in our study with two different words. We're using both patient and participant. And I would standardize it so that I'm always referring to them in the same way. So we're talking about participants, not patients throughout. So that's the sort of thing that I would do, standardizing terms. So uh, we've talked about the expectations of scientific language, using clear language, simple language, checking for a complete message and just getting everything perfect at the end. And as a result, you're going to write simply, clearly and completely. So as for last time, before I take your questions, I'd like you all to take a moment and think of one practical, concrete thing that you're going to do with the information from this workshop. It's a Friday evening. Um, so let's say something you're going to do next week on Monday morning pop it in the comment box, something that you're going to do with this information. And Alaa said, yes, that we've encouraged the reader to continue reading your article by writing like this. Yes, it is so much easier for the reader. They will actually want to read your writing. They'll keep going. They won't have to put it down or run to Google quickly and ask what, what the different words mean. So what are some of your next steps using what we've covered today? So if we can just get a couple of next steps and then we can do a last, um, any questions? Great, thanks, Hannon. Hannon said that the, that the lecture was very helpful. That's really glad to hear that. Um, as always, it's, I've really enjoyed my time with you guys. Thanks so much for being super interactive and having some fun with that piece. Um, oh, Shahid has said, I'm gonna spend some time revising. Um, their next piece, great. Oh, and um, sorry, the chat's moving too quickly for me to keep up. Uh, Miriam's asking for recommended programs to check grammar and spelling. I don't actually have any. I would just have spell check turned on when you're working in Word, to be honest. It's absolutely fine. Um, Allah has said next time we're going to work on an article, definitely use these tips in writing. Great. I was suggested reading an article and seeing if they applied what we learned today. That's a really nice suggestion. I like that. If you'd like to practice these kinds of things, you can grab a piece of writing that you've done in the, la in the last little while and see how would you change it now? Oh, Arub's going to edit their research proposal again. Awesome. Uh, Reem's going to review the manuscript um, from their supervisor. So Ibrahim's asked if they've got any more examples like we did today. Um, not that I've got at the top of my head, um, but I would say the examples that I used, it was a made up example, but it was based on things I see in academic writing all the time. So to be honest, the next time you're reading a journal article, just have a look at it and think, ah, oh, that's that, that's that thing. This is how I would change it. Um, being really intentional when we read can be very helpful in developing our academic writing, particularly if you see things where you say, oh, that's really clear, good communication. Take note of that and have a think, why do you think it was such good communication? Hassan's asking, um, how much does it cost to publish in a well-known journal article on average? Okay, so that's article processing charges. If you, so it depends whether you're talking about open access or traditional journals. Traditional journals don't charge you anything to publish with them um, because the reader pays, so there's a subscription fee. So if you publish in a traditional journal that sells the articles for its pay-per-view, either library subscription or, <coughs> excuse me, um, either library subscriptions or individual article, um, then the, re the author doesn't pay. If you're going for um, article processing charges with an open access, then there is an upfront fee. It's a really wide range. Um, I would say on average, you're probably looking um, at around one and a half to two and a half thousand pounds. That seems to be more or less where they sit at the moment, depending on the journal. 
Muhammad's asking, is using we, I good or not advised in scientific writing? So with, ac with active voice, you will find yourself using we and I. It depends on the journal. Some journals don't like it. Most are moving towards being all right with it. Um, I would say it's completely fine. And I know that there was a couple of folks who were right working on their dissertations. For dissertations, again, check with your supervisor how your institu institution feels, but it tends to be a good idea to be writing in first person and to be saying who did what. Um, so you can make it really clear how much of the work is actually yours when you're writing a thesis. Okay, are there any other questions? So it's really nice of a bunch of folks saying that they had, that they enjoyed the session and that they found it useful, which is great. Um, if you'd like to follow on with anything that we do at the Equator Network, so I'm part of the UK Equator Centre at the University of Oxford. Um, we look after the Equator Network's Twitter account, account which is Equator Network. Um, and you're welcome to follow us there. We occasionally tweet ideas about academic writing um, and good reporting, and we share reporting guidelines. So you can follow us along there on Twitter. That's Equator Network. Um, and then our website is www.equator-network.org um, and we are always posting things about um, good reporting and resources for academic writing.